Exposition of the Divine Principle Diagrammed Lecture Manual for One Hour Lectures House of Unification for World Peace From True Parents Life Course At 16, I had a mystical experience. In the morning of Easter, after I made a long, tearful prayer, Jesus Christ appeared to me and gave me many revelations and teachings. He told me much about deep and amazing things. He said that God is grieved because of suffering humanity, and he asked me to undertake a special role on earth for the sake of God's work. In short, a spiritual world suddenly opened up before me, and I could freely communicate with the saints there. In the quietude of a deep North Korean mountain, I talked with Jesus Christ several times. The truth revealed at that time forms the core of the unification principle. That was the beginning of the revelation. Ever since that special meeting, I have been conversing with the saints of the spiritual world, including the living God and Jesus. Little by little, God taught me the amazing truth. It was as if the morning sun was rising after a long and dark night. In this truth, I could see the dawn of the glorious new culture. This special revelation, based on the New Testament, has the power to bring all the religions together. Today this revelation is called the Divine Principle, and I have received an order from God to spread the Divine Principle to the ends of the earth. The main branches of the Divine Principle are the Principle of Creation, Human Fall, and Restoration, Salvation, and Second Advent. Now we introduce a one-hour manual, which presents just the core contents of the principle. But there are other versions of this manual that organize more detailed contents. Introduction Everyone is struggling to attain happiness and avoid misfortune. People feel joy when their desires are fulfilled. Within the self-same individual are two opposing desires the original mind, which desires goodness, and the evil mind, which desires wickedness. Any being possessing such a contradiction within itself is doomed to perish. Christianity sees this state of destruction as a result of the human fall. Considered from the viewpoint of the intellect, the human fall represents humanity's descent into ignorance. People are composed of two aspects internal and external, or mind and body. In the same way, there are two types of ignorance, internal ignorance and external ignorance. Humanity through religion has followed the path of searching for internal truth, and through science has followed the path of seeking external truth. Religion and science have seemed in the course of their development to take positions that were contradictory and irreconcilable. However, for humankind to completely overcome the two aspects of ignorance and fully realize the goodness which the original mind desires, at some point in history there must emerge a new truth which can reconcile religion and science and resolve their problems in an integrated undertaking. Mission of New Truth The new truth should be able to embrace all historical religions, ideologies, and philosophies and bring them into complete unity among them. The new truth should guide fallen people to return to the original state. God has sent one person to this earth to resolve the fundamental problems of human life and the universe. His name is Sun Myung Moon. Part 1. Chapter 1. Principle of Creation. Problems Concerning Human life and the universe cannot be solved without first understanding the nature of God. One way to fathom God's deity is by observing the universe which he created. Just as we can come to know the character of an artist through his works, so we can understand the nature of God by observing the diverse things of creation. Romans 1.20 Let us begin by pointing out the common elements which are found universally throughout the natural world. Number one, every entity, both within the entity and between it, and other entities, possesses dual characteristics of 
yang and yin. Number two, more fundamentally, every entity possesses both an outer form and inner quality. The visible outer form resembles the invisible inner quality. The inner quality is called internal nature, and the outer form or shape is called external form. The internal nature and external form together constitute dual characteristics. The first cause of all things must also possess the dual characteristics of internal nature and external form which stand in the position of subject partner to the internal natures and external forms of all beings. We call the first cause God and his internal nature and external form the original internal nature and original external form. God also exists based on the reciprocal relationship between his dual characteristics of the yang and yin. God is harmonious union of the original internal nature and original external form, harmonious union of masculinity, yang, and femininity, yin, subject partner of internal nature and masculinity towards the universe. Relationship between God and the universe. God is the invisible subject partner, and the universe as a whole is a substantial object partner to God. In accordance with the principle of creation, God's dual characteristics manifest itself symbolically or in image as individual embodiments of truth which constitute the universe. Universal Prime Energy God, the creator of all things, is the absolute reality, eternal, self-existent, and transcendent of time and space. Universal prime energy is the fundamental energy of God's being. It is the origin of all energies and forces that allow created beings to exist, give and take action. Through the agency of universal prime energy, the subject and object elements of every entity form a common base and enter into interaction. This interaction, in turn, generates all the forces the entity needs for existence, multiplication, and action. The interaction generating these forces through this process is called give and take action. Origin, division, union, action. The process in which out of God, the origin, two entities are separately manifested and reunited in oneness is called Origin, Division, Union, Action 3. Object Purpose As a result of Origin, Division, Union, Action, four positions are formed. The Origin God at the center, the Subject Partner and the Object Partner, and their Union. Any one of the four positions may assume the position of Subject Partner and engage the other three as its Object Partners, forming a communion of three Object Partners. When each of the four then acts as the subject partner and enters into give and take with the other three revolving around it, they fulfill the three object purpose. Four position foundation. When the origin, the subject partner, and the object partner projected from the origin and their union all engage in a harmonious give and take action and fulfill the three object purpose, the four position foundation is established. The four position foundation is the fundamental foundation of goodness and the realization of God's eternal purpose of creation. The purpose of creation. The three great blessings, Romans 1, 28, are fulfilled when the whole creation, including human beings, completes the four position foundation with God as the center. This is the kingdom of heaven, where ultimate goodness is realized and God feels the greatest joy. This is, in fact, the very purpose for which God created the universe. God's three blessings. God's first blessing is to perfect our individual character for this. An individual's mind and body should become one person through give and take action, thereby forming a God-centered Individual for Position Foundation In fulfilling God's second blessing, an individual perfected man and woman should join in loving oneness as husband and wife and raise children. 
thereby constructing a God-centered family for position foundation. God's third blessing is to perfect human dominion over the natural world. For this, human beings and the natural world should become completely one universe, thereby establishing a God-centered for position foundation of dominion process of the creation of the universe. The biblical period of six days for the completion of the universe in Genesis 1 is not to be reckoned by the number of literal sunrises and sunsets. It symbolizes six ordered periods of time in the creation process. The fact that it took six time periods to complete the creation of the universe implies that some period of time was also necessary to complete the creation of each of the individual entities that make up the universe. Growing period for the creation. All creation reaches perfection by passing through three ordered stages of growth, formation stage, growth stage, and completion stage. When created beings are in the growing period, God has regard only for the fruits of their growth, which are based on the principle. In this way, He governs all things indirectly. We call this growing period the realm of God's indirect dominion or the realm of dominion based on accomplishments through the principle. All things reach perfection after passing through the growing period by virtue of the autonomy and governance given by God's principle. Human beings, however, pass through the growing period and reach perfection by fulfilling their own portion of responsibility in addition to the guidance provided by the principle. In corporeal world and the corporeal world, the universe was created after the pattern of a human being who is in the image of God's dual characteristics. Hence, corresponding to the human mind and body, the universe consists of the incorporeal world and the corporeal world, both of which are real and substantial. The two worlds together form the cosmos. When we shed our physical bodies, we enter the incorporeal world as spirits and live there for eternity. Chapter 2. The Human Fall No one has known the root of sin. Christians on the basis of the Bible have held to a vague belief that Adam and Eve's eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was the root of sin. Many Christians have thought that the fruit was that of an actual tree. Many important parts of the Bible are expressed in symbols and metaphors then. What does the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil represent? To learn this, let us first investigate the tree of life, which stood next to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2.9. Tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life symbolizes an ideal man who has fully realized the ideal of creation. It symbolizes perfected Adam. The tree of knowledge of good and evil represents the ideal woman, perfected Eve. Identity of the serpent. In the Bible, we read that a serpent tempted Eve to commit sin, Genesis 3, 4, 5. The spiritual being represented by the serpent was originally created with a good purpose, but later fell and became Satan. We must conclude that the serpent is an angel, 2 Peter 2, 4. The fall of the angel and the fall of human beings. From Jude 6 7, we can infer that the angel fell as a result of an illicit sexual relationship. From Genesis 3 7, we can infer that Adam and Eve sinned with their sexual parts. Hence, we can deduce that an illicit sexual relationship must have occurred between the angel and human beings. Fruit of the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil The fruit signifies the love of Eve. Eve's eating of the fruit denotes that she consummated a satanic love relationship with the angel, which bound her in blood ties to him. The Root of Sin The root of sin is that 
the first human ancestors had, an illicit sexual relationship with an angel, symbolized by a serpent. They could not multiply God's good lineage, but instead multiplied Satan's evil lineage. Chapter 3, Eschatology and Human History, The Meaning of the Last Days. The last days comes as a result of God's providence of restoration to save fallen people. The last days is this time when, with the advent of the Messiah as the turning point, the evil world under satanic sovereignty is replaced by the ideal world under God's sovereignty. Hell on earth will be transformed into the kingdom of heaven on earth. Therefore, it will not be a day of fear when the world will be destroyed by global catastrophes, As many Christians have believed, in fact, it will be a day of joy when the cherished hope of mankind will be realized. The present era is the last days. Signs of the last days. Fire judgment. The heavens will be kindled. 2 Peter 3.12 The tongue is a fire. James 3.6 Fire judgment. Judgment by tongue. Judgment by word. 2 Peter 3.12 says, The heavens will be kindled and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire. As James 3.6 says, The tongue is a fire. The fire judgment Jesus came to bring was a judgment by the tongue, and thus a judgment by the word. Last Days, New Truth and Our Attitude With spirit and truth, God restores human beings who fell into ignorance through the fall. Spirit and truth are unique, eternal and unchanging. However, the degree and scope of their teaching and the means of their expression will vary from one age to another as they restore humankind from a state of utter ignorance. For modern intellectual people to be enlightened in the truth, there must appear another textbook of higher and richer content with a more scientific method of expression. We call this the new truth. Chapter 4, The Messiah. Salvation through the cross. Jesus came as the Messiah in order to establish the kingdom of heaven on the earth. Did Jesus' crucifixion enable the faithful believers in Jesus to become perfect and build the kingdom of heaven on earth? There has been no one who lived his life in inseparable oneness with God. There has never been a believer who had no need of redemption or a life of ardent prayer and devotion. Christian parents continue to transmit the original sin to their children. This teaches us that the cross has not perfectly restored our original nature. Limit of Salvation Through the Cross and Jesus' Second Coming The people led him to the cross. Jesus' body took Satan's assault and he was killed. Consequently, Christians cannot attain physical salvation. However, Jesus laid the basis for spiritual salvation by securing the victorious foundation for his resurrection through the redemption by his blood on the cross. As a result, all believers since his resurrection have received the benefit of of spiritual salvation. To complete the work of spiritual and physical salvation, Jesus must come again on earth. Jesus' death on the cross. Was Jesus' death on the cross the most desired will of God? Number one, judging from the words and deeds of the disciples as recorded in the Bible concerning the death of Jesus, they were unanimously grief-stricken and indignant Acts 7:51 through 53. 2. Judging from the viewpoint of God's providence, God called the chosen people of Israel and prepared them to receive the Messiah. 3. The words and deeds of Jesus himself were meant to engender belief on the part of the people that he was the Messiah. John 6:29, Matthew 23:37, John 10:38. From all the above evidences, we can deduce that Jesus' death on the cross was the unfortunate outcome of the ignorance and disbelief of the people of his day, and not a necessary outcome of God's predestination. Second coming of Elijah and John the Baptist 
The Jews of Jesus' day were waiting for Elijah because God had promised through prophet Malachi that Elijah would return before the advent of the Messiah. Jesus testified that the prophesied coming of Elijah was realized in John the Baptist. Matthew eleven fourteen, seventeen thirteen. The faithlessness of John the Baptist. Many among the Jewish leadership and Jewish people had the highest respect for John the Baptist. Some even thought of him as the Messiah. But in ignorance of God's providence, John denied his being Elijah, which became the principal reason why the Jewish people rejected Jesus. Here we can understand that the main reason why Jesus had to die on the cross was the failure of John the Baptist. Chapter 5, Resurrection Resurrection means to come back to life. To come back to life implies that we have been dead. Here, death means the death caused by the fall. Regardless of human fall, God created the human physical self to grow old and return to dust. Only the spirit self enters the spirit world and lives eternally there. Hence, the death caused by the fall does not mean the end of physical life, but rather the descent into Satan's dominion through eating the fruit. Meaning of Resurrection Resurrection may be defined as the process of being restored from the death caused by the fall to life, from Satan's dominion to God's direct dominion, through the providence of restoration. Chapter 6, Predestination Prosperity and decline, happiness and misery, salvation and damnation, rise and fall of nations. Theological controversy over predestination has caused great confusion in the religious lives of many people. In the Bible, we find many passages which are often interpreted to mean that everything in human life comes to pass exactly as predestined by God. Yet, we can find sufficient evidence in the Bible to refute the doctrine of absolute predestination. How does the divine principle resolve this issue? Predestination of God's will. God could not accomplish his purpose of creation due to the human fall. Accordingly, God's will in carrying out his providence for fallen humanity is still to accomplish the purpose of creation. In this sense, God's will is that restoration be accomplished. God is the absolute, unique, eternal, and unchanging being. Therefore, His will must also be absolute, unique, and unchanging. The predestination of God's will is absolute. Predestination of fulfillment of God's will and predestination of human beings. Although God's will of the providence of restoration is absolute and beyond human influence, its fulfillment necessarily requires the accomplishment of human portion of responsibility. God predestines the process of its fulfillment conditionally, contingent upon the completion of the 5% human responsibility in addition to the 95% responsibility of God. Therefore, the predestination of the fulfillment of God's will is conditional, and the predestination of human beings is conditional. Elucidation of verses which support absolute predestination. The book of Romans say, Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Romans 8, 29, 30. Predestining and calling the person is God's responsibility. But only when the person completes his responsibility after being called by God is he justified. Hence, God's predestination concerning an individual's glorification is thus contingent upon the fulfillment of of his portion of responsibility. Chapter 7, Christology Issues which fall within the scope of Christology include the Trinity, which deals with the relationship between God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and rebirth, which concerns the relationship between Jesus 
the Holy Spirit, and fallen people. The value of a person who has realized the purpose of creation. A perfect person who has realized the purpose of creation. Number one, assumes a divine value comparable to God. Two, is a unique existence in the cosmos. Three, has the value of the entire cosmos. Jesus and the person who has realized the purpose of creation. There is no greater value of a person who has realized the ideal of creation. This is the value of Jesus, who surely attained the highest imaginable value. Jesus is a perfect human being who realized the ideal of creation. Is Jesus God himself? When Philip asked Jesus to show him God, Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show me the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? John 14, 9, 10. Based on such biblical verses as this, many Christians have believed that Jesus is God, the Creator. Jesus may well be called God because, as a man who has realized the purpose of creation and who lives in oneness, With God, he has a divine nature. Nevertheless, he is not God himself. The body may be understood to be the mind's second self, but it is not the mind itself. By analogy, Jesus may be understood to be God's second self, but he is not God. Rebirth and the Trinity. Jesus, Holy Spirit, and their mission to give rebirth. Jesus said, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 3. Why must fallen people be born anew? Adam and Eve fell and became evil parents, multiplying evil children. Hence, fallen people must be born anew as children without original sin. Jesus came as the true Father in order to give rebirth to fallen people, transforming them into good children thoroughly cleansed of original sin. The Holy Spirit came as the true Mother. To fulfill the purpose of creation, Jesus and the Holy Spirit unite through give and take with each other, with God, as the center, and form the four-position foundation. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit thus become one, and this oneness constitutes the Trinity. Spiritual and perfect trinities, Jesus and Holy Spirit in oneness with God, could form only a spiritual trinity, and fulfill only the mission of spiritual true parents. Christ must return in the flesh and find his bride. They will form on earth a perfect trinity with God and become true parents both spiritually and physically. They will give fallen people spiritual and physical rebirth, removing their original sin and enabling them to build trinities on earth with God as the center. Part 2. Principle of Restoration Introduction to Restoration The providence of restoration refers to God's work to restore fallen people to their original, unfallen state so that they may fulfill the purpose of creation. Since the providence of restoration is God's work of recreation, which has as its goal the fulfillment of the purpose of creation, God works this providence in accordance with His principle. In the course of the providence of restoration, this principle is called the principle of restoration. Restoration and perfection of fallen people. Human beings fell from the top of the growth stage and have been held under Satan's dominion. To be restored, we, fallen people, number one, first need to go through a course to separate Satan from ourselves in order to restore ourselves in form to the spiritual level which Adam and Eve had reached before the fall, the top of the growth stage. Two, on this foundation we are to receive the Messiah and be reborn, remove our original sin, and thereby be fully restored to the original state of human beings before the fall. Three, finally by following the Messiah we should continue our growth to maturity. Four, where we can fulfill the purpose of creation. Principle of Restoration Through Indemnity Where do human beings stand after the fall? If the first human ancestors had reached perfection, they would have lived relating only with God. However, due to their fall, they joined in a kinship of blood with Satan. Immediately after the fall, they found themselves 
in the midway position between God and Satan, where they were relating with both. A fallen person will go to God's side if he makes good conditions, and to Satan's side if he makes evil conditions. Establishing indemnity conditions. When someone has lost his original position or state, he must make some condition to be restored to it. The making of such conditions of restitution is called indemnity. How does a condition of indemnity compare with the value of what was lost? An indemnity condition can be made at a price equal to less than or greater than the value of what was lost. As for the method, an indemnity condition is made by reversing the course through which the original state was lost. It is we ourselves who must fulfill the necessary indemnity conditions as our portion of responsibility. Foundation for the Messiah How Adam failed to achieve the purpose of creation. For us fallen people to receive the Messiah, we must establish the foundation for the Messiah. To establish this foundation, since an indemnity condition is established through a reverse course of the failure, we must know how Adam failed to achieve the purpose of creation. First, Adam should have established the foundation of faith by keeping strictly God's commandment and passing through a set growing period. Second, Adam should have established the foundation of substance after establishing an unshakable foundation of faith, he was then to become one with God, thereby becoming a perfect incarnation of the Word and attaining individual perfection. However, Adam failed to establish these conditions and thus failed to achieve the purpose of creation. How can we lay the foundation for the Messiah? Therefore, in order to receive the Messiah and complete the purpose of creation, we must restore the foundation of faith and foundation of substance, and thereby the foundation for the Messiah. In order to restore the foundation of faith, first there must be a central figure, second, a condition must be offered, third, a numerical period of indemnity must be completed. In order to lay the foundation of substance, we must make the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature. Chapter 1, Providence to Lay the Foundation for Restoration, Adam's Family For the providence of restoration to be accomplished in Adam's family, the members of his family had to make certain conditions of indemnity to restore the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance. On these two foundations, the foundation for the Messiah was to be established and the Messiah could have come to Adam's family. Foundation of Faith To restore through indemnity the foundation of faith, we must set up a condition substituting for God's word. For Adam's family, this object was a sacrificial offering. The foundation of faith also requires a central figure instead of Adam. His sons, Cain and Abel, offered the sacrifice. What was the reason for this? God symbolically divided Adam who embodied both good and evil, by giving him two sons, Abel, representing good, and Cain, representing evil. God set them in positions where each dealt with only one master, God or Satan, and had them offer sacrifices separately. Abel made the offering in a manner acceptable to God in this way. He successfully laid the foundation of faith, foundation of substance, in order for the foundation of substance to be laid in Adam's family, Cain had to fulfill the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature by submitting to Abel so that God could gladly accept Cain's sacrifice. Making indemnity conditions to remove fallen nature. Indemnity conditions to remove the fallen nature are made through the reverse course of the fall. Cain should love Abel, number one. 2. Receive God's love from Abel. 3. Obediently submit to Abel, accepting Abel's dominion. 4. Learn God's will from Abel, multiplying goodness. Foundation of Substance However, Cain killed Abel, thereby repeating the sin of the archangel and manifesting the primary characteristics of the fallen nature. Adam's family thus failed to lay 
the foundation of substance. Consequently, God's providence of restoration through Adam's family could not be fulfilled. Noah's family, foundation of faith. In the providence of restoration in Noah's family, the central figure to restore the foundation of faith was Noah. The condition through which Noah was to restore it was the ark, which signified the new cosmos. Through the 40 days of flood judgment, Noah's family offered the ark in the manner acceptable to God and restored through indemnity the foundation of faith, foundation of substance. For Noah's family to make an acceptable, substantial offering, Ham, Noah's second son, and the central figure of the substantial offering was to restore the position of Abel. To do this, Ham had to become inseparably one in heart with his father, Noah, who had made the symbolic offering. Providence to achieve Ham's artistic oneness with Noah. Genesis 9, 20, 26 reports that when Ham saw his father lying naked in his tent, he felt ashamed of Noah and stirred up the same feelings in his brothers, Shem and Jabbath. When Ham felt ashamed of his father's nakedness, an act that resembled Adam and Eve's covering their lower parts and hiding, he made a condition for Satan to enter, hence... His feeling and act constituted a sin. Consequently, Ham failed to restore through indemnity Abel's position from which to make a substantial offering. Ham failed to establish the foundation of substance and the providence of restoration in Noah's family ended in failure. Abraham's family. God commanded Abraham to offer a dove, a ram, and a heifer to restore the foundation of faith. Because Abraham did not cut the dove, birds of prey came down and defiled the sacrifices. This mistake meant that he did not separate good and evil and thus had the effect of acknowledging Satan's claim of possession over the sacrifices. Through this failure of the symbolic offering, all conditions God intended to restore through it were lost. As a consequence, Abraham's descendants had to suffer 400 years of slavery in Egypt, and the providence centered on him was prolonged through three generations of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham's Offering of Isaac After Abraham failed in the symbolic offering, God gave him another chance by commanding him to sacrifice his son Isaac as a burnt offering with absolute faith. Abraham put forth his hand and took the knife to slay Isaac. But the angel of the Lord came to him from heaven and said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. Result of Offering of Isaac Abraham's zeal to do God's will and his resolute actions carried out with absolute faith, obedience, and loyalty lifted him up to the position of already having killed Isaac. Therefore, he completely separated Satan from Isaac. Because Abraham succeeded in his offering of Isaac, the providence of restoration in Abraham's family could be carried on by Isaac. In this way, Isaac, having inherited Abraham's mission, made the symbolic offering and restored through indemnity the foundation of faith. Foundation of Substance Isaac's sons Esau and Jacob had to stand in the divided positions of Cain and Abel respectively. Then, by making a substantial offering, they had to fulfill the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature and lay the foundation of substance. Jacob was victorious in the fight with the angel and restored dominion over the angel. Thereupon, he received the name Israel and laid the groundwork upon which the chosen people would be established. When Esau opened his arms and affectionately welcomed Jacob as he returned to Canaan, they fulfilled the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature. Their victory restored through indemnity horizontally in one family, the long vertical course of history in which God had been working to restore the foundation of substance. Foundation for the Messiah Foundation for the Messiah was established in Abraham's family, despite the failure of Abraham's symbolic offering. 
God regarded Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the same person with respect to his will, even though they were three different individuals. Chapter 2, Moses and Jesus in Providence of Restoration. God set up the courses of Jacob and Moses as models for Jesus' course to save humankind. Satan, who does not meekly surrender even before God, would by no means readily surrender to Jesus. Therefore, God called upon Jacob and Moses and worked through them to show the course for bringing Satan to submission. Moses' course and Jesus' course. Moses brought the Israelites out of Egypt, the satanic world, with miracles and signs, led them across the Red Sea, and had them wander through the wilderness before entering the promised land of Canaan. This foreshadowed the course on which Jesus would one day lead Christians. With miracles and signs, Jesus would bring Christians out of lives of sin and lead them safely across the troubled sea of evil. He would take them through a desert devoid of life-giving water before giving them into the Garden of Eden of God's promise. Both courses were prolonged three times because of the Israelites' faithlessness. Providence of Restoration under the Leadership of Moses Third National Course to Restore Canaan The first national course to restore Canaan based on Moses' 40 years in Pharaoh's palace and the second national course based on his 40 years in the wilderness of Midian all ended in failure due to the faithlessness of the Israelites in the third national course through the 40 years wandering in the wilderness honoring the tabernacle until the Israelites returned to Kadesh Barnea, Moses was able to establish the foundation of faith, foundation of substance with Moses. The Israelites were to establish the foundation of substance by honoring the tabernacle with faith and devotion and following Moses into Canaan. God instructed Moses to strike the rock with his staff that it might yield water and give drink to the people, however. When Moses heard the people complaining against him, he raged in uncontrolled anger and struck the rock twice. This created a condition for Satan's invasion, and thus Moses failed the dispensation to start based on the rock. As a consequence, he was not permitted to enter the promised land. Foundation of Substance with Joshua God elevated Joshua to Moses' place. Joshua sent two men to spy out the city of Jericho. When they returned from Jericho, the two spies made a faithful report. The younger generation of Israelites raised in the wilderness all believed the spies' words, and this faith enabled them to start the third course. After the Feast of Passover, they set out for Jericho. After marching around the city for seven days, they raised a great shout, and the city walls tumbled down. Joshua conquered Canaan and defeated 31 kings altogether. Based on this victory, they laid the foundation of substance in the third national course, Providence of Restoration, under the leadership of Jesus. Course to Subjugate Satan Jacob walked the symbolic course to bring Satan to submission while Moses walked the image course. Their courses pioneered the way for Jesus to walk the actual course. In walking the worldwide course to subjugate Satan and restore Canaan, Jesus followed the model demonstrated in the national course to restore Canaan, in which Moses was working to subjugate Satan. A second worldwide course to restore Canaan, Foundation of Faith. The first worldwide course to restore Canaan ended in failure due to the faithlessness of John the Baptist. Jesus himself now took on John's mission. When Jesus went through the 40-day fast and three temptations in the wilderness, it was to separate Satan for the very purpose of restoring the foundation of faith and start the second worldwide course to restore Canaan. Foundation of Substance Due to the faithlessness of the Jewish people, however, Jesus had to bear the cross and, 
The Second Worldwide Course thus ended in tragic failure. Third Worldwide Course to Restore Canaan, Spiritual Foundation of Faith. The resurrected Jesus spiritually resumed John the Baptist's mission. During the 40-day period of his resurrection, Jesus fulfilled the spiritual dispensation of 40 for the separation of Satan. By doing so, Jesus restored the foundation of faith for the spiritual course in the third worldwide course to restore Canaan, spiritual foundation of substance. The resurrected Jesus gathered his scattered disciples and worked the dispensation to start by giving them the power to perform signs and miracles. The faithful believers in the position of Cain believed in and devotedly followed the resurrected Jesus, thereby fulfilling the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature and restoring the spiritual foundation of substance. Course to restore substantial Canaan under the leadership of Christ at the second advent. While Jesus has been restoring Canaan as a worldwide spiritual realm, the Christ at the second advent is to complete this third worldwide course as a substantial course and realize the actual kingdom of heaven on earth. Hence, returning Christ must be born on earth in the flesh. He will not die without fulfilling the providence of restoration. Because God's providence, after Adam and Jesus, will be successful on the third attempt, that is, at the time of the second advent. Moreover, God's spiritual providence of restoration, during the 2,000 years since Jesus has prepared a democratic society and legal environment, which will protect Christ at the second advent, The returning Christ will conduct the dispensation to start based on the word and then complete the foundation for the Messiah, both spiritually and physically. Upon that foundation, he will cleanse all humanity of the original sin and restore them to be God's children born of his lineage. He will begin by laying, both spiritually and physically, the family foundation For the Messiah, he will then expand its scope to the clan, society, nation, world, and cosmos. When this foundation is secure, he will finally be able to build the kingdom of heaven. Chapter 3, Periods in Providential History and the Determination of Their Length When a period of history repeats the events of a previous period, all by With differences in scope and degree, the two periods are called parallel providential periods. Parallel providential periods recur because of repeated dispensations to restore the foundation for the Messiah. Accordingly, the factors which determine the formation of parallel providential periods are First, the three conditions necessary for the foundation of faith, central figure, the condition, and the numerical period of indemnity second, the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature which is necessary to restore the foundation of substance, prolongation of the providence of restoration according to the principle of predestination. Since God absolutely predestines his will, he surely will realize it one day. However, whether God's will is fulfilled through any particular individual is conditional upon the fulfillment of his portion of responsibility, which is in addition to God's portion of responsibility. Accordingly, when the will is not fulfilled because the responsible person fails, God will choose another person in a different era to take his place. God will continue his work until its complete fulfillment, prolonging the providence in the process, according to the principle of creation. When the providence of restoration is prolonged, it may extend to as many as three stages. Chapter 4, Parallels Between Two Ages in the Providence of Restoration Characteristics of a Period In order to examine the characteristics of a providential period, we need to identify the people centrally responsible for God's providence in that period and the source material for their history. The history of Israel 
which was centrally responsible for God's providence in the age of the providence of restoration, provides the source material with which to study the providential history in that age, the history of Christianity, which was centrally responsible for the providence in the age of the prolongation of the providence of restoration, provides the source material for understanding the providential history in this age. The age of the prolongation of the providence of restoration has been to restore, through substantial parallels, the age of the providence of restoration, the age of image parallels. As the periods of this age were to restore through indemnity, the corresponding periods of the previous age, these periods proceeded in a parallel fashion, both in order and in length. The 400-year period of persecution in the Roman Empire in the age of the prolongation of the providence of restoration was to restore Israelites' 400-year period of slavery in Egypt. Likewise, the 400-year period of regional church leadership was to restore the 400-year period of the judges and the 120-year period of the Christian Empire was to restore the 120-year period of the United Kingdom. The 400-year period of the divided kingdoms of East and West was to restore the 400-year period of divided kingdoms of North and South. The 210-year period of papal exile and return was to restore the 210-year period of Israel's exile to Babylon and return. Another 400-year period of preparation for the advent of the Messiah elapsed before Jesus came. Likewise, Christianity is to meet Christ at his second advent only after passing through 400 years of preparation for the second advent of the Messiah. Providence of Restoration and Progress of History The ideals of interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universally shared values versus communism. In seeking for an ideal society on heaven's side, people's original mind has drawn them to the ideals of interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universally shared values. The world in which these ideals will finally be realized is none other than the kingdom of heaven on earth under the leadership of the returning Christ. Since Satan mimics God's providence in advance, the satanic side has advocated scientific socialism based on dialectical and historical materialism and built the communist world. New expression of truth. For the paths of religion, politics, and economy to converge and realize God's ideal, a new expression of truth must emerge which can completely integrate religion and science. The religion founded upon this truth will lead all of humanity to become one with God in heart. Such people will build an economy in accordance with the divine ideal, providing the foundation for a new political order to realize the ideal of creation. This will be the messianic kingdom, built on the principles of interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universally shared values. Chapter 5, Period of Preparation for the Second Advent of the Messiah The 130-year period began in 1517 when Martin Luther raised the banner of the Protestant Reformation and lasted until the religious wars were settled by the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. In the late Middle Ages, man's original mind was repressed, its free development blocked by the social environment of feudalism and the corruption of the Roman Church. Medieval Europeans sought to break down their social environment to open the way for the restoration of their original nature. The Cain-type movement began as a revival of Hellenism, and gave rise to the Renaissance, whose core value was humanism. The Abel-type movement began as a revival of the Hebraic heritage of Israel, and gave rise to the Protestant Reformation, whose core value was faith in God. Period of Religious and Ideological Conflicts 
The 140-year period began with a secure establishment of Protestantism as the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 and ended with the French Revolution in 1789. After the Renaissance and the Reformation, modern people could not avoid divisions in theology and disputes among philosophies arising from freedom of faith and thought. God's providence of restoration separates those representing Abel from those representing Cain, and in the last days, this fallen world is divided into Cain-type and Abel-type worlds. The Cain-type world is to submit to the Abel-type world to establish the worldwide foundation of substance. This is necessary before we can receive Christ at the second advent and realize the unified world. For this to happen, two views of life, which would later mature into these two worlds, had to be established. The Cain-type and Abel-type views of life developed in this period. Period of maturation of politics, economy, and ideology. This period refers to the 130 years between the French Revolution in 1789 and the end of the First World War in 1918. Cain type and Abel type views of life matured, taking their separate paths, and founded a Cain type society and an Abel type society, respectively. A Cain type view of life gave rise to the French Revolution and thus Cain type democracy, which eventually formed the communist world. The Abel type view of life led to the Puritan Revolution and thus Abel type democracy, which developed into the democratic world of today. The World Wars, Providential Causes of the World Wars We cannot grasp the providential significance of the world wars by focusing only on their external causes, conflicts in politics, economy, and ideology. What are the internal providential causes of the world wars from the viewpoint of God's providence of restoration? Internal providential causes of the world wars the world wars have occurred first as a result of Satan's last, desperate struggle to preserve his sovereignty. Second, in order to fulfill the worldwide indemnity conditions to restore the three great blessings defectively realized by Satan in advance. Third, in order that all humanity may overcome on the world level Jesus' three temptations. Fourth, in order to fulfill the worldwide indemnity condition to restore God's sovereignty. The providential results of the First World War. Victory of God's side, upholders of Christianity. U.S., Britain, France, and Russia. Defeat of Satanic side, persecutors of Christianity. Germany, Austria, Turkey. The victory of God's side, countries taking the same direction as God in the First World War, laid the foundation for the birth of the returning Christ and the formation stage of the dispensation of the Second Advent commenced. Providential results of the Second World War. Victory of God's side upholders of Christianity, U.S., Britain, France. Defeat of satanic side persecutors of Christianity, Germany, Japan, Italy. New heaven and earth, under returning Christ, growth stage of the dispensation of Second Advent. Through the victory of God's side in the Second World War, the age for building a new heaven and new earth under the leadership of Christ at the Second Advent had begun, and the growth stage of the dispensation of Second Advent commenced. Is the Third World War inevitable? As a consummation of human history, Satan's side and God's side will strive until they each attain sovereignty over a world. This is why the democratic world and the communist world stand confronting each other. Consequently, it became inevitable that there be world wars first to divide and then to unify these two worlds. The first and second world wars had the providential purpose to divide the globe into these two worlds. Afterward, the third world war must take place to unify them. However, there are two possible ways it may be fought through armed conflicts or as a wholly internal ideological conflict. By which way the war will be fought depends upon success or failure in carrying out the human portion of responsibility. Providential results of the Third World War. Victory in the Three World Wars. Realize God's ideal world. 
by winning victory in the three world wars, which belong to the final chapter of providential history, God's side will fully restore through indemnity all the aspects of the providence of restoration and realize God's ideal world. Chapter 6, The Second Advent Jesus clearly foretold of his return, yet he added that no one knew of the day of his return, Matthew twenty four thirty six. Nevertheless, we can deduce from the scriptural verse, Surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets, Amos 3, 7. And God will surely reveal all secrets about the second advent to his prophets before he carries out his work. Accordingly, God will certainly give prophecies to those faithful believers who are in the light. When will Christ return? We call the time of Christ's second advent the last days. As it was already explained in eschatology, we are living in the last days today. We can thus understand that today is truly the time of Christ's return. We can thus conclude that the period of the second advent began soon after the end of the First World War. In what manner will Christ return? Many of us have read the Bible with a preconceived notion that Jesus will come on the clouds, Matthew 24, 30, 31. If Jesus were to return literally on the clouds of heaven, however, would he not readily be accepted and honored, even by this sin-ridden world? Jesus foresaw that at the second advent, when he is born in the flesh, he is likely to be persecuted and condemned as a heretic. That is why he foretold. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, Luke 17.25. Also in Luke 18.8, Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Hence the second advent of Christ will take place through his physical birth on earth. Where will Christ return? Based on such passages as Revelation 7.4, Matthew 10.23, and Matthew 16.28, some Christians expect that Christ will come again among Jewish people. But in Matthew 21.33-43, Jesus clearly conveyed that he would not come again among the Jewish people. God will take away the mission of previously entrusted to them and give it to another people who can produce its fruits upon Christ's return. Therefore, chosen people after Jesus' crucifixion are not the descendants of Abraham, but rather the Christians who have inherited the faith of Abraham. Christ will return to a nation in the East. Revelation 7, 2, 4 indicates that the seal of the living God will be placed on the foreheads of the 144,000 in the East, where the sun rises. Revelation 14.1 says that these chosen ones will accompany the Christ at his return. We can thus infer that the nation which will inherit the work of God and bear its fruit for the sake of the second advent is in the east. The nation in the east is Korea. Since ancient times, the nations in the east have traditionally been considered to be the three nations of Korea, Japan and China. Japan entered the period of the Second Advent as a fascist nation and severely persecuted Korean Christianity. China at this time was a hotbed of communism and would become a communist nation. Both nations belong to Satan's side. Korea, then, is the nation in the East where Christ will return. Qualifications of the nation to which the Messiah returns. Number one, object partners of God's heart path of blood, sweat, and tears, people of goodness, religious character, worship God, loyalty, filial piety, and chastity. As a nation to which the Messiah returns, Korea had to meet the following qualifications. To become the object partners of God's heart, we must first walk a path of blood, sweat, and tears. Hence, the miserable history of the Korean people was the path required of the chosen people of God. Such a nation must be a people of goodness. The homogeneous Korean people rarely invaded other nations. The Korean people are, by nature, endowed with a religious character. They have evinced a strong desire to worship God and always revered the virtues of loyalty, filial piety, and chastity. 2. 
Prophecies and Revelations, Messianic Idea of Korean People, Chonggamnok, Revelations that the Founders of Religions Will Return to Korea, Revelations and Signs, Acts 2-7, Clear Revelations that the Lord Will Come to Korea. The Korean people have believed in the prophecy that the righteous king will appear and found a glorious everlasting kingdom in their land. This messianic idea was revealed through Chonggamnok, a book of prophecy written in the 14th century Korea. Among the faithful of every religion in Korea are those who have received revelations that the founders of their religions will return to Korea. Revelations and signs are being given to spiritually attuned Christians testifying to the second coming of Christ in Korea. They are sprouting in profusion like mushrooms after a rain. Hence, many are receiving clear revelations that the Lord will come to Korea. The Necessity for Unification of Languages If human beings had not fallen, we would have formed one global family like a body with God as the head. Then there never would have risen a profusion of tongues unintelligible to one another. If we are to realize the ideal world of one global family, which can honor the returning Christ as our true parent, surely our languages must be unified. If Christ does indeed return to Korea, the Korean language will become the mother tongue for all humanity, and all people will have to speak it. All of humanity will become one people and use one language, thus establishing one global nation under God. This ends our principal lecture, and I will conclude by reading an excerpt from President Dr. Hak Jahan's speech to world leaders. From President Hak Jahan's speech, Women are leaders of the ideal world. The mission of the Messiah, the Savior, is to teach how to liquidate the sinful history which has been tangled up after human beings had fallen away from the path of true parents, true husband and wife, and true children. Today, I declare to heaven and earth that my husband, President Sun Myung Moon, is the one who has been pioneering the path of true parents and the Messiah all his life. As you know very well, despite the severe persecution by the evil world, my husband, President Moon, has been pioneering the future of humanity by revealing the purpose of God's creation and the original sin committed by human ancestors. His teaching, the divine principle, affirms that the ideal of the second advent aspired to by the founders of all religions, be it the return of Maitreya, the Awakened One, a new Confucius or Jesus, is realized in the advent of one Messiah as a true parent of mankind, through which the religions will be unified. However, this advent will not occur as a return on the clouds of Jesus, who died 2,000 years ago, as Christians believe, but rather in the form of the birth of the one who inherits the mission of Jesus. So far, no one has been able to fight against sexual promiscuity and adultery, which have been corrupting mankind. But now the truth of hope that can thoroughly resolve this problem has emerged in our age in Korea. This truth, brought to light by the true parents, will be the light of all mankind to unify South and North Koreas and build the world of peace. Let us embrace this truth and put an end to the sinful world which has been tormenting us all throughout history and, as fighters, build the world of unification overflowing with freedom, peace, and happiness. Thank you.